OC Rock Radio. This is the Cover 2 Podcast live from the OC Rock Radio studio at Saddleback College. I'm Nick Nina. I'm Jared Smith. And we got a lot to talk about, specifically a lot of football to talk about because, of course, it was week one of the NFL. Finally, football is fully back. We got high school, college, and uh, NFL football on every single weekend for the next couple months. It's like Christmas. Yeah, it's I woke, great. I woke up I was, Sunday morning. I know you're excited because you, you've you been talking about it for a long time. Just so super excited about the, this NFL uh, season one finally coming, or week one finally coming. Oh, yeah. I mean, the thing is, the NFL has the longest offseason of the four major sports. So, you know, you have OTAs, you have uh, mini camps, you have training camp. All leading up, and then you have four preseason games all leading up to week one. So I think it's just a huge build up. The NFL always does a fantastic job of, you know, kind of uh, replaying games from the previous year on the NFL network and showing a lot of the preseason games and getting everyone pumped up, plus with fantasy football. So all of that combined, uh, you know, is, is a big reason why I was so excited for week one. Uh, definitely watched as many games as I could, especially that Thursday night opener with the Patriots. Oh, yeah. Uh, big upset. We're definitely going to talk, speak about that. And then all the, the Sunday games and then the, the crazy games that ended on Monday night with the Chargers and the Broncos. So I thought it was a great weekend of football. Obviously, um, some some really good play. And then there are a couple teams that uh, kind of stuck Didn't play good at all. Yep. Not nope. at all. Nope. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely get into that as well. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm excited. What about you, Nick? We'll, we'll definitely talk about the fact that the fantasy football, uh, there was a lot of stars oh, that didn't boy. do anything. Oh, boy. I mean, I my team got like 50 points this week. Although my two starters in each of my leagues uh, were out. My two best players uh, just due to the – uh, Hurricane Irma and Odell Beckham Jr. being out. But other than that, it, it just did seem like it wasn't a very star-studded weekend, but it was still a fun weekend of NFL, and we have definitely a lot to talk about. Let's start with your Dallas Cowboys, because that was one of the main attractions of this weekend, Sunday Night Football, Giants and Cowboys. And Jared, your Cowboys start 1-0. and oh. How do you feel? And let's talk about the game. Uh, you know what? It, it was honestly, in my opinion, somewhat of a boring game. It was. I agree. I agree. I lost goals. interest in about the third quarter. Yeah, uh, Jason Witten, I believe, had the very first touchdown of the game. But you know, the Cowboys were able to move the ball against the Giants' defense, which I wasn't surprised by. Um, I think I was more surprised with the Cowboys' defense and how they were able to hold the Giants' offense in check. Now, obviously, with the Giants not having Odell Beckham Jr., that is a huge blow to a. Uh, but for me, when you bring in Brandon Marshall. And you draft uh, Evan Ingram, the tight end out of Ole Miss. And then you still have Sterling Shepard as a, as a slot receiver, plus Eli Manning. Um, I was very surprised that that Giants offense was not able to move the ball against, in my opinion, what's an average at best Cowboys defense. But I have to give a lot of props to them. Um, you know you know what this, this really reminded me of, or not reminded me of, but what I thought of during this game and towards the end of the game was, if I'm Odo Beckham Jr., um, I am I am running to the Giants and saying you guys are gonna pay me whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because that game showed that without Odell Beckham, the Giants cannot do anything. And even with the additions of, like I said, Brandon Marshall and Evan Ingram, they are not the same offense without Odell. And if he is not on the field, in my opinion, that team has no chance to make it to the playoffs. I'm glad you said that. Because I wrote down first thing I wrote down about this game was. Giants are nothing on offense without <laughs> Odell Beckham Jr. So true. <laughs> they were so bad. I mean, like you said, it was boring because there wasn't a fight in the Giants on offense. No. I wanted it to be a game. You know, I'm not a fan of either team. You, you, you obviously are, so you're rooting for the Cowboys. But um, it, it was probably great for you to see them play on defense. But for, for a fan just watching the game and w- hoping for uh, a potentially two Super Bowl teams playing each other, the Cowboys look like the only legit contender in that game. Yes. I mean, seriously, Odell Beckham Jr., you're right. He's going to get paid a lot now because uh, I, this will continue as long as he's not playing. Now, uh, Chris Collinsworth kept saying during the game, maybe they should have put him out there just to uh, use him as a decoy. Uh, I, th- I think that would have been hard to do since he, he did seem pretty injured in warm-ups. He, he was grimacing on a lot of his pass catches. I think you will see that this week, at least him on the field. He might not get a lot of action, but... I mean, man, they sucked on offense. It was terrible. Yeah, they do. Now, they're playing on Monday night against the Lions. Uh, so, Monday night, they, you can't come out and stink the best, especially their home opener as well. Um, so, like I said, I was, I was surprised on both ends, surprised that the Giants offense was not able to get things going in a sense. Um, and also, very 
uh, happily surprised that the Cowboys defense was really able to hold their own. I believe they had, uh, I forget how many, how many total sacks they had against Eli Manning, but sure. which is very unusual because Eli Manning is known for getting the ball out quick, and really what you want to do with him is just get pressure, kind of get hands in his face and kind of annoy him, but the Cowboys were actually able to get home multiple times. Yeah. Uh, they were able to turn the ball over once, uh, forced an interception, so that along with their offense, which is going to only continue to get better, and, uh, you know, it's looking great. Now, it's still early. I, either way, for, for both the Cowboys and the Giants, I don't want to sit here and overreact and say, oh, wow, the Cowboys are just automatic Super Bowl contenders. Yeah. Or, oh, wow, the Giants are just, they're done. Because that's just an overreaction, especially in the first week. But I do like what the Cow- I, I did see from the Cowboys. And uh, a great start for them. I will say, Dak Prescott in the first half did look a little, um, I don't know if scared is the right word, but he, he definitely had three or four high throws, a couple Hmm. of Des Bryant, and so I think it took him a minute to settle into the game. Um, You know, going into this sophomore season, there's a lot of talk about he's going to have a sophomore slump, that type of thing. So I think there was some jitters and some nerves in the first quarter, but I think he was able to work his way through that as the game progressed. And especially going into next week, playing Denver in Denver with that that vaunted defense and that no-fly zone, uh, he's really going to have to be on point if the Cowboys are going to come out with a victory in week I'm going to disagree with you slightly on that. I actually thought he played pretty good most of that game. I don't know if you're saying he played bad necessarily. I think you're nitpicking because you're a big fan of the team. I thought he played fantastic. I didn't see him do too much wrong in that game. I think their offense looks the same as last year, which is a very good thing. I think Bryce Butler showed up in that game, played well. Des Bryant looked better. Ezekiel Elliott looked exactly the same. And as long as they have him on the field, they're definitely Super Bowl contenders for sure. Oh, no, of course. Yeah. As long as he is on the field and as far as right now, as long as that injunction is still in play, then Ezekiel Elliott is allowed to play. Yeah. Until things are completely Very settled. interesting little scenario with that, a too. Bit, came yeah. out where it just it, all of a sudden he's not suspended anymore, you know? No, I, it, the, the suspension is still there. So for those who maybe fully don't understand, it's not like the suspension, the suspension has gone away. It's still kind of lurking in the background. But because there was the injunction, now there's an appeal. And until the appeals process is completely finished and the judge makes a final ruling, Ezekiel Elliott... Is, is eligible to play in all these games. So there, I'm not really sure if there even is a timetable at this point. So until that judge makes a ruling, Zeke can play in all the games. Um, so I did want to bring up one. Did you see Cole Beasley's catch? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I watched That's it over. What, I rewinded it about three times. I, that was unbelievable. <laughs> now, Crazy. a lot of people were comparing it to the Odell Beckham catch. Nah, Get out of here. No, no, that, no, was, no. that was not even in the same no, ballpark. That was not even close to being as hard but as Odell's. it was a concentration on his part. And to me... He, I mean, he is... He's got about seven feet in. After now, this may too. be biased from a Cowboys fan, but I feel like he is like the new Wes Welker in the slot. I think one-on-one in the slot, he is unguardable because he does a lot of option A lot routes. like, well, you say Wes Welker, a lot like Julian Edelman. Yes, and a lot like too. Julian Edelman as well. I, I think those guys who are short, quick, uh, and get in and out of their breaks so they run really, really great routes, I think those guys in the slot... Uh, wide receiver position are almost unguardable one-on-one because they have option routes they can go in or they can go out so unless you're double teaming them or you're playing a zone it's it's really just going to be bread and butter all day for Dak Prescott so uh, really happy with the way that he played as well and like I said the, the team played very well 100 percent. and so from one NFC East team to two NFC East teams they played each other this Sunday uh, the Philadelphia Eagles and Washington Redskins played uh, their first meeting of the season, and the Eagles got the best of the Redskins, 30-17. to 17. To me, it was a surprise uh, that it was that Carson Wentz played as well as he did. I, I expected a little bit of a sophomore slump. Didn't look like it too much. I do think the media the first couple days after this Sunday has kind of overrated him and acted like he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and I think it was based on one play where he got out of the pocket, avoided some tackles, and passed to a wide-open Nelson Aguilar, but he did play well. I mean, you have his stats up here, 307 yards, two touchdowns. His, his completion to attempts was only 26 to 39, which is why I'm saying he didn't play that well, you know what I'm saying, but he did play good enough to win, obviously, they won 30 to 17. Uh, Kirk Cousins, on the other hand, looked good until about the fourth quarter, and then he didn't make the big plays when they needed to happen. And if he wants that big contract, he's going to need to make those plays, and he's going to need to win games like that. Because although that score looks more lopsided, it being 30-17, to 17, it, was, it was very close most of the game, and then there was a fumble, and a defensive fumble return for a touchdown that made it um, the score higher at the end of the game. What were your thoughts on the game? My thoughts were, I think both these teams are similar, I think they have an outside chance of the playoffs, just basing off one game. 
Yeah, like I said, you know, I don't want to sit here and overreact again. But uh, if I had to choose a team that looked more prepared and, and more, uh, I guess, of a playoff team down the stretch, I would have to lean towards the Eagles. In my opinion, Kirk Cousins was Kirk Cousins on Sunday. He had he flashed some moments where he made some really great plays. And then towards the end of the game, when, when they really needed a touchdown, he threw an interception uh, towards the goal line. Exactly. That's yeah. Kirk Cousins. I, I don't know if you can trust him uh, to win you games. Yes, um, he, he's going to average between 40 and 50 uh, passing attempts a game. So you're going to see the yards. You're going to see the multiple 300-yard passing games. And the stats are going to be there. But it's really about when the game counts, when it's under two minutes, and you need to drive down 80 yards and score a touchdown, do you trust Kirk Cousins to make the right decisions? And personally, I think he showed in week one that you can't trust him. So everyone wants to sit here and say, oh, you know, he's going to sit here and get that $100 million contract and all that stuff. I mean, listen, I guess that's the going rate for these quarterbacks, but I would be very hesitant to fork out that kind of money for a player that I don't think has the, uh, you know, in the fourth quarter, I don't think he has that, that it factor. No, I 100%. And I'm looking at his stats too. He's a $100 million quarterback, uh, 17 incompletions, only 240 yards in a, in a division game, too. One touchdown and interception? No, he's not. I don't think uh, so. You saw, well, we'll talk about this later, too, because it's, it was the Cardinals game, but Stafford played pretty well, especially in the fourth quarter against the Cardinals, played up to his contract, really showed that he's in it to win it this season. Kirk Cousins, on the other hand, trying to win that contract, didn't do that in my mind. And it's going to be, I think I said this too when we did the preview uh, show last week, it's one of those teams, there's a lot of teams out there in the NFL these days, where it's your quarterback plays well or your season's screwed. And definitely the Redskins are one of those, especially that lo- after losing guys like Deshaun Jackson and Pierre Garçon on offense, he really needs to play well um, too. Uh, but other than that, I thought these two teams, they look similar last year. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I do see these teams competing every single game to win games. I don't see these, either of these teams being losing, uh, having losing records. I don't know if you, I may be overreacting because it is week one, but I don't know if you agree with me on that. I, I will say this. I think they will both, both teams will be able to compete every single week. Um, I don't see either team getting blown out from week to week or anything like that or being one of the, you know, top three worst teams in the league. But because, and I I said this last week on our NFL preview show, that because of the division they're in, because I feel that the Cowboys and the Giants are the two best teams in that division, I just don't see either of these teams making the playoffs because of that. Now, they can go on to have eight and eight seasons or or a nine and seven season. uh, But like I said, because of the division they're in, uh, I don't see them making it to the playoffs. But if I, like I said, if I did have to pick one team, I would definitely pick the Eagles because I think their overall talent uh, and along with their, with their coach, their head coach, um, I would lean more towards the Eagles than with the Redskins. Like I said, with, with Kirk Cousins and with Jay Gruden, uh, I, I don't trust nor have they shown that they can compete, make it to the playoffs, and, and win games. No, 100%. And I forgot to add that the Eagles' uh, addition of Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith definitely help them. Oh, yes. It adds that deep threat oh, of course. that, that uh, Carson Wentz really needs. And, and Carson needed Wentz year. can throw that thing. Absolutely, yeah, he can, 100%. He can chuck it 70, 80 yards. So uh, for defenses, don't don't think that they're not going to you know try and air it out because especially with Torrey Smith, um, you know, Austin Jeffrey is more of a red zone target and kind of a possession receiver, but Torrey Smith, he can still take the top off of defense. So uh, teams definitely need to be aware of that. Um, so, yeah, no. And even Nelson Algalar, the former USC yeah. Trojan, um, he – Kind of finally did up, something. Finally did something. <laughs> yeah. Coming out as a first round draft pick a few years ago, he's he's been somewhat of a bust so far. Yeah, totally. Uh, so you know, this year obviously with with uh, Jordan Matthews leaving, but with, even with the additions of these new receivers, he's been in this offense now. Uh, so he's kind of one of the veteran receivers. So it was nice to see him score a touchdown. He had six six receptions for eighty six yards and, and one score. So that was really really nice to see from him. Hundred percent agree. Uh, so we'll switch from uh, the NFC East to the AFC East. In what was at least uh, with me, one of the biggest upsets of the weekend. And it was the first game of the entire season. The Chiefs and Patriots, uh, where the Chiefs won 42-27. to 42? Four, fourth quarter comebacks. Alex Smith throwing deep. What the hell is going on? It's crazy. I mean, the, the, the Chiefs dominated the Patriots in the second half. Something we don't see a lot. And Tom Brady, he, he didn't play good at all. Uh, 267 yards, uh, 50% completion uh, 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 rating. Percentage. Percentage. Yeah, you got to say I got the word for it. Um, he didn't play well. 
Uh, your initial thoughts on the Patriots Chiefs game? Just looking at the stats right now, you would think that it would be switched. That Tom 100%. Brady would have the four touchdowns and the 368 yards, and Alex Smith would have the 267 yards and no touchdowns. Uh, I don't think anyone saw this coming. Now, I will say that I think the Chiefs are a very good team, and uh, the past three seasons, the Chiefs are in the top three in most wins. So they are a very good team. Andy Reid has put his stamp on this team uh, with a run-first concept and playing great defense. Uh, but I just did not see this team coming in with all the new additions that the Patriots had and coming off a Super Bowl win, having the first game of the year, the, the ring ceremony. You got the celebration with Mark Wahlberg, you know, of, too, yeah. Mark, of course, Tom Brady, just all of that. I did not see this at all. This was a complete center. And to me, I think this shows more than anything that the Chiefs are, are for real. I, now, listen, the Patriots are still going to be great. They're still going to bounce back. The Patriots play the Saints this upcoming Sunday, week two. If I'm the Saints, I'm really scared. Oh, Because you know the Patriots probably locked themselves in Gillette Stadium all week long, didn't go home, and you know they are doing nothing but preparing. They're going to come out and want to kick some butt. So if you're the Saints, if I'm the Saints, I'm really scared. But going back to the Chiefs, I, I think this showed more about what this Chiefs team can do. And even without having losing their number one running back in the preseason and having to have uh, Hunt, a rookie, come in and really completely shine, uh, 17 carries for 148 yards. And a touchdown. Against also them. a long receiving touchdown. Look at his and, receiving and, stats. And receiving stats. Yeah, uh, 133 oh. receiving yards? Are he's, you kidding? He's trying to David Johnson this year. He's he trying is. to go 1,000-1,000. Thousand, thousand. He is. As a rookie against yeah. the Patriots? Are you kidding? So, no, uh, like I said, a lot of credit has to go to this Chiefs team. And, uh, no, this Chiefs team is for real. Go going back to that AFC West with them and the Raiders, I think it's going to be, and we talked about this last week as well, I think it's, it's going to be neck and neck between those two teams. It's going to go down to the last week or two of the season to see who can who can edge out uh, and win that division. Uh, but good win for the Chiefs. Uh, but, no, the Patriots are going to bounce back. Like I said, do not overreact on them. They still have Tom oh, Brady totally. and they still have Bill Belichick. They're going to be just fine. Yeah, my take on this game was the Chiefs really impressed me. The Patriots lost the football game. I don't think this is a Patriots thing where they're going to be bad this year. And I heard somebody say that that the Patriots were going to potentially tank to get one of those quarterbacks. Oh, my god! I gosh. mean, that's got to be one of the stupidest things I heard oh over the weekend. Uh, but I'm not echoing that at all. I think the Chiefs really impressed. Uh, obviously, they have a running game. They have a passing game now. They have a deep passing game, which they haven't had in a long time. They still have a great defense, although they lost Eric Berry. I'll talk about that in a second. But I do think the Patriots just lost this football game. I think they lost Dante Hightower for a bit in this game. That really affected their defense in key situations. But I expect them to still go 13-3, and 12-4, win the AFC East, and be there when it comes Super Bowl time. You know, I could see these teams rematching in the playoffs, but I think they're that good. I think it's, these are one of the, these two teams where you could actually say, you know what, they looked so good, both teams, or at least the Patriots, will, will look good. They, they, they've always looked good. Uh, that you could actually say, I could expect these two teams to meet in the playoffs later. And, and I, I think it's going to be really interesting because the Chiefs have looked better than they have the past couple of years. Now, I may be overreacting because it's week one, but it just seems like they have all the elements, the deep ball, the running game, and the defense. Now, I do want to talk about Eric Berry. I do think that affects them a lot on defense because Berry is obviously a big-time stopper on defense. It's fine. And, uh, but um, he stopped Rob Kronkowski in that game, too. He did. he did. And that was a big factor, too. That, that was another reason why I just think the Patriots just lost the game because they were outplayed. Um, and the Chiefs uh, played really well. But come to these teams when there's a good tight end or there's a, there's a receiver that needs to be um, covered by Eric Berry, you're not going to be missing that. You're missing potentially the best safety in the league. Yes. Now, so it definitely will affect them. But how much do you think it will affect them this season? How much... Let's say in that AFC West race, do you still give it to the Raiders because Barry um, is the he's out now, or are you saying, oh, the Chiefs will still be good enough too? I, I think the Chiefs have the depth and the, their defensive scheme. I think they will still be able to compete and play well. Obviously, when you lose a player of that caliber, there is no uh, replacing that to an extent. Eric Barry is Eric Barry for a reason. He's a multiple Pro Bowler for a reason, and like we said. Rob Gronkowski, for the entire game, had two receptions for 33 yards. Terrible. Eric Berry was locking him up. Now, you can't just ask a, your backup safety to go in and do that. But uh, because they have Justin Houston, Marcus Peters, uh, and, and a, a whole other host of defensive players who I think are very good, um, along with their offense, 
I think they will still be able to compete. I'm not going to you know, now just give the division to the Raiders because of this. But this is a big blow. And it, and it really more, I think, is more than just on the field. I think Eric Berry's leadership with oh, that 100%. team, um, I think that's what's going to be missed. Now, I'm sure he's still going to be around the facilities and, you know, still try to be in meetings with the players and helping the young guys as much as he can. But um, the leadership factor, I think, is what really is going to uh, affect this team, if any. Um, getting team, Getting players lined up getting guys in the right position. I mean, Eric Berry was the leader and the, the captain of that defense. He was the last line of defense. He was the one that always made sure everyone was, uh, was lined up in the right position. So I think that is what they will miss uh, more than anything. So it's going to be on the other players to really step up and kind of take over that leadership role. But, uh, you know, hopefully he can have a speedy recovery. Um, obviously, this guy's just been dealt blow after I, blow. I know, seriously. You know, coming, um, coming back and beating cancer, that was obviously amazing. Um, and now having to go through this this other Achilles injury. So, uh, you know, this for him, he came out and said, listen, I beat cancer. So this is, there's no doubt in my mind that I can come back. Exactly. Which yeah. is really, really great to hear. You know, hopefully his spirits stay high and uh, he can come back next year and continue to, to ball out for this team. No, totally. So a couple of good games there. We'll talk about the NFL a little bit later. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to be back talking some college football because oh, there yeah. was some great college football games this weekend, oh, yeah. including a couple upsets. So we'll talk about that on the other side of this break. This is the Cover 2 podcast on OC Rock Radio. Bouncing it outside, now cutting it back and into the end zone. Touchdown. That's just Lamar Jackson being Lamar Jackson. The Lamar Show continues. Three passing touchdowns, three rushing touchdowns today. There is no stopping. Number eight for the Cardinals. We're going to run it when they know we're going to run it. Well, you highlighted the run game. What we saw from Carr, what we saw from Ronald Jones. Is this what we can expect from the Trojans this season? Well, it's Trojan football is to run the ball and then try to throw it over your head. And uh, the two runners in the offensive line did a tremendous job. Yeah, some of you might not love this, but this is authentic. And this is because of what he felt and his teammates felt for the home field loss a year ago. He's to the 45. He's oh, to he's the 50. Oh, it. no, he's not. No, he's not going to plant it in the midfield of the O, is he? Wow. Yes, he is. Ooh. Looks like the Ohio State band has come out of their seats. That they, they, they didn't like that. There's no one here to defend the, the O except the band. Cover 2 podcast back on OC Rock Radio. I'm Jared Smith. And I'm Nick Nina. And Nick, it's time to talk a little college football. A crazy week two with uh, some big time top 25 matchups. Uh, I want to get started really quick with Oklahoma and Ohio State. Oh, big game. A rematch of last year where uh, Ohio State went into Oklahoma, went into Normandy, and really put it on the Norman, Sooners. Not Norman. Norman, yeah. sorry. Did I say Normandy? <laughs> yeah. so, wow, man. Sorry. I, I, need, I haven't had my coffee this morning, apparently. I know. Same uh, with me. A little bit. Yeah. yeah. Norman. Uh, so if you say anything stupid, that's it's, why. It's okay. That's why. Don't blame yeah, me this not, morning. Yeah. It's been a long morning, but it's okay. We're going to get through it. Uh, Norman. So, But no, uh, this rematch uh, in at Ohio State. Really, I was kind of surprised and taken back by the just lackluster start that Ohio State has had so far. Nick, I want to get your initial thoughts because I know you have a lot of notes right there. I see yeah. some highlighting. Uh, looks like a little bit of coloring over there. So I'm gonna. Let I've you highlighted take JT Barrett and Baker Mayfield's name for oh, sure. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, for different reasons. <laughs> so I'll start with JT Barrett. There's a lot more to talk about with Baker Mayfield on and off the field. Uh, but JT Barrett. Uh, has been disappointing. I, I, if we would have talked about college football last week, we talked, we did the NFL previously, so we weren't able to talk about college football at all. Uh, I would have said, you know, Ohio State didn't look that good, and then they did. They looked worse against Oklahoma. Uh, JT Barrett, I, I don't know what's up with him, but he seems a little bit overrated to me uh, this season, at least. Is I don't know. He's had a lot of time to be the quarterback of that team. And it's now on that stage where I'm kind of saying, well, maybe this guy isn't as good as he, he, people think he is. Maybe it's just a system thing where he plays well with Urban Meyer. I know he's had uh, multiple uh, offensive coordinators and stuff, but so have a lot of guys at these big colleges. I mean, look at the guys at Alabama. It seems like they have a different coach every game. I mean, I remember it was, it was Sarkeesian and Lane Kiffin. There was different quarters, although they didn't win the championship, but they were pretty uh, doggone close. So... I don't know what's up with JT Barry. I mean, stats, 250 all-purpose yards and zero touchdowns. How do you throw or not score any touchdowns in a game when you're the best player on the field? You're the quarterback of a, an elite 
college football team in Ohio State, and you don't do anything in the game besides 250 yards? I think it was like 100-something yards passing. Yeah, 183. Yeah, really. Okay, that, that's great, JT Barrett. So I thought he played awful. Now I'm going all in. Okay. Uh, and then Baker Mayfield, I thought, played excellent. Uh, he played great. He reminds me a lot of Johnny Manziel in a couple ways. Oh, okay. uh, Not 100%. And that's not to be super derogatory, statement. but obviously he's had the off-the-field um, stuff happen to him. And, uh, and after the game, he decided to plant that flag, uh, the Oklahoma flag, in the middle of the O. It's the dagger in the heart. Dude, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I hated that he apologized for it because I know the administration in Oklahoma got to him and said he needed to apologize. But I remember there was one quote where he said, uh, I didn't mean to offend any Ohio State uh, people. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you 100% did. You're totally lying. It's 100% a lie, you saying that. So I thought the game was great. Uh, that's just my initial thoughts on the two quarterbacks. What was your thoughts on the game? And maybe if you have some opinions about the quarterbacks too. Yeah, I do. And, and for me, with Ohio State's offense, I actually blame Urban Meyer. I feel that this is more I agree about yeah. the scheme and this offense. I think it's a Listen, combination of both. This Ohio State team for the last, ever since Urban Meyer has stepped foot on campus, has been in the top 10 in recruiting and, and more or less the top five every single year. There is more talent on this team probably than almost any other team in the country. The fact that JT Barrett, who's been with this team for over four years, was only able to throw for 183 yards. Now listen, Oklahoma has a good defense. They are not the 85 Chicago Bears. Nope. Okay. Uh, or, you know, one of the, the great defenses uh, like USC or Alabama or anything like that. Now, it's not a knock on them. What I'm saying is to be at home and a rematch game like this on, you know, on the, the bright lights, they, I believe it was like a 5 o'clock game, ABC, it was the five national th- yeah, TV, it was the and to come game. out and, and pretty much 16 points, that's it. Um, I, so for me, it is more about Urban Meyer, this coaching staff, and how I don't think they are using their weapons like they should. Uh, their two top receivers, K.J. Hill and Austin Mack, combined for six catches for uh, 75 yards. Hey, one of them was just one catch. To- yeah, one catch. Um, that No receiver had over 50 yards. That's terrible. To me, that is unacceptable. Now, but that's I- where I think J.T. Barrett comes in, too. I think he has something to blame. But some of his throws were awful. True. That game. Very true. I- I- actually, I shouldn't even say some. A lot of them were. I mean, his completion percentage was terrible. Um I just think, yeah, it's it's some Urban Meyer and JT Barrett need to figure out. Because I do think Urban Meyer can help him out. I'm just saying we've all hyped this guy. I mean, maybe there was a reason Cardell Jones won the national championship and not JT Barrett. Very true. You know what I'm saying? Uh, maybe this guy isn't really championship material uh, and it isn't going to be able to win a title. And and I think right now, if he doesn't improve, they're definitely going to lose another game this season, probably to a Michigan or Penn State, and they're not going to be in the Final that's Four. Be, you lose two games, yeah, you're, you're not going to play out. Especially when you're in the Big uh, Big Ten, because you're probably losing to one of those good teams, too. Michigan. So... Or Penn State. Penn State's pretty good, too. Very true. But, um, so I just think he needs to step up. And as far as Oklahoma goes, I think they're set. They just need the, – that the Big 12 is not that hard of a conference. I think if they can just run the table, they are set to be in that playoff. They look really good. Do you think this game showed more about Oklahoma State or showed that Ohio State maybe isn't that good? Who, who would you give the, I think it's the more – th- uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, it's – I would say it's more Ohio State not being as good as I thought, but I'm going to put the blame on the quarterback. I just okay. think the quarterback isn't as good. And when you're on one of these teams, I mean, you look at Michigan, for example. Michigan hasn't had the best quarterback the last couple of years, and they're always 10-2. and two. I'm going to go with, with Oklahoma, and I think that this team is actually very dominant. And I'm not saying that they would beat Alabama, but right now they could line up against Alabama and, and probably push them back. Oh, to- totally, yeah. I think that is how good this team is. And I was actually very skeptical of this team going in, into the season because of Coach Bob Stoops, how he is no longer there. I think that was somewhat of a shocking move, how he had decided to step down and retire. Um, I think that was huge in the recruiting. You know, it, it's kind of a, obviously it's a, it's a every year thing for these coaches. They go into these kids' homes, these high school kids' homes, and say, hey, I want you to come play for me. I'm going to be here for your entire four-year career. I'm going to take care of you, all that you know, all that nonsense that they always say. And then he decides to up and retire. And uh, so I was very skeptical. Yeah, how about Lincoln team. Riley? Yeah, Lincoln Riley. No, he has. He, he stepped in and done a fantastic job. And obviously, this is still Bob Stoops' team, all of his recruits. But the fact that Lincoln Riley has been able to come in, uh, really, you know, buy in and, and get the players' support and get the players to back him and say, hey, listen, guys, you know, we're not really going to change a whole lot. The schemes are going to be somewhat the same. Uh, we're going to tweak some things here and there. But I think for the most part, they've really come out. And, and Baker Mayfield, um, being the veteran that he is, 
he is, I think right now, you know, it's it's obviously only week two going into week three, but I think he's got to be an early Heisman candidate along with oh, Lamar totally, Jackson, yeah. the way that he's played so far. No, 100%. Uh, but this was a good game. There was another good game at the exact same time. There was actually, well, here's what I loved about college football this week. There was four really, really good games on at the exact same time. I was going to hand cramp from going back and forth with 100%, the percent Yeah. No, it, the, the second game, though, and this I, I believe the game we probably watched the most, both of us, USC and Stanford. Uh, this was a very entertaining game. USC got the best of Stanford. When I mean got the best of them, I mean got the best. They beat Stanford. They won that game handily, although the score might not look at it, especially in the second half. USC really, really played well against the, Stan- against the Stanford Cardinal. And Sam Darnold returned to Rose Bowl Sam Darnold. We saw them play kind of bad last week against Western Michigan, and then they come out and they beat Stanford. Uh, it looked like to me old school USC coming up in big games and playing well. Uh, Sam Darrell, like I mentioned, 316 yards, four touchdowns, and the running backs. Oh man, they got a two headed running back there at USC. Stephen Carr, Ronald Jones, the third, both 100 yards, and Jones getting two touchdowns as well. I think USC should have moved to the three spot in the rankings. They moved to the fourth. Uh, obviously, that isn't the college fo- football playoff rankings, it is the AP poll. Uh, but I do think they're the third best team behind Oklahoma and Alabama. Do you disagree? I No, I do agree. I think the reason that they are number four is because of their week one performance when they played Western Michigan. They really should have blown Western Michigan out, and the fact that they were able to make it a game, and it really came down to the fourth quarter. I believe at one point Western Michigan was up 21-14, to 14, so that was a little bit of a shock. So I feel the, the college committee is saying, hey, listen, we know you're a good team. You're more than likely going to stick around in the top five, but you know I think they needed to see more of a dominant performance. And going up against a Stanford team who was in the top fifteen, um, obviously Coach Shaw has really just taken you know the same blue book print uh, yeah. from from John Harbaugh uh, um, and really just kept that same. All they do is run the ball. They are one of the only teams in college football that I see that still comes out with three tight end sets, a fullback, a running back. You know it's going to be a run, and they say try and stop us. And guess what? For the first half, USC was not able to stop Stanford. It was really the second half adjustments and the fact that USC's offense, <clears throat> sorry, USC's offense was able to get rolling. Sam Darnold looked like Sam Darnold in this game. I think yeah. the first few weeks he was kind of um, pressed a little bit, and I think he was, you know, forcing some things. All summer, all you heard was Sam Darnold, Heisman candidate. It's his team this year. What's he going to do? You know, he's going to be a one and done, or not a one and done, but this is going to be his last year. He's going to go into the NFL. I think he was getting all this type of hype and press. And I think that was a little much for him. I'm not saying he couldn't handle it or can't handle it, but I think it, you know, his first few weeks, it was going to take him time to settle in and to adjust. And he really came out and showed it against his Stanford team. But like you mentioned, Stephen Carr. This kid is a true freshman, oh, man. and he reminds me, his speed, his breakaway speed, to me, remind, is Chris Johnson type. Like, ah, it could be, yeah, that's, good. that's a good comparison. When he's in the open field, he's gone. You are not going to touch him. And the fact that you have him plus Ronald Jones, who is uh, almost the same body build, but a little more of a bruising back, you got to have that thunder and lightning. If those two can stay healthy throughout the year, and you can have this running game to go along with Sam Darnold and the receivers that this team has... Listen, this team is not easily, but they're going to be in the top four. They're going to make it to the playoffs. And just like Oklahoma, uh, I think they can challenge Alabama for that national championship. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you. And this is why I didn't overreact to the game against Western Michigan. No, not not at all. Because I knew they would have to come back and show that they could beat Stanford. Because if they would lose to Stanford, more than likely that kind of killed their playoff chances. So I knew they'd come out. Uh, and play well, and and yeah, I I I like the way the play of Deontay Burnett too, receiving as well. I thought he did really good at diving, catching the end zone. Oh yeah, multiple plays where he had long yardage. So this team, you, they got receivers, they got running backs. The defense is good. They got Cam Smith back finally for a full game, uh, and obviously the quarterback is potentially the best in the entire nation, potentially the number one pick in the NFL draft if he goes out. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention also was that Stanford. You mentioned they ran the ball. Got to give credit to Bryce Love, 160 yards and a touchdown in the game. Uh, his defense just didn't pick him up, that, that, entire, that entire team. It is hard to stop USC, but that Stanford defense has kind of been a team that doesn't let 42 points a lot, and I think they let the, the, the Cardinal down, especially in the second half. Yeah, dude. No, I think Stanford is still going to be a very, very competitive team, 
and I think they're still going to have a chance to win that Pac-12 North. I think it's going to be between them and Oregon uh, to see who wins that battle. So don't write off Stanford just because they did have Washington, somewhat of a disappointing loss. that division too. Yes, they are. So a uh, great division. Do not wash, wash off Stanford. They're still uh, going to be involved. And, you know, listen, they're still going to be around. So I think this is still, for the Pac-12 overall, I think this is USC's division to lose. Absolutely. But, uh, no, Stanford's going to come back next week. And I guarantee you Coach Shaw is going to have them ready to go. Oh, yeah. They're playing Texas next week. And what, what they're calling a rematch of the national championship, that's not what it's going to be. It's going not to be USC all. kicking Texas' ass. Oh, really? That's what it's going to be. Okay. 100%. Very strong yeah, words. I, I, will, I will predict it. I will predict it. USC, USC will beat Texas by at least uh, three touchdowns. At least three? Uh, yeah. Man. I, I, I mean, I'm a good. USC fan as well. but I, I don't Tom know Herman's I'm already calling out his own team. Okay. It's, it's, it's not going good over there in okay. Texas. No. So I'm going USC wins like... I don't know, a forty-nine to twenty-eight, forty-nine twenty-one, something like that. It's you gonna heard be, it first. It's gonna be good. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll see. So uh, hopefully I'm right. Uh, so move on to a couple other games that were on around the exact same time. Uh, we'll start with this: Georgia and Notre Dame, the rival of USC. Uh, this was a good game. Twenty nineteen is the first time Georgia had ever gone up to South Bend to play a game, and uh, and they showed out. I initially thought Notre Dame would totally win this game. I didn't think Jake Fromm had it in him to make big plays from Georgia. He did. He, he proved me wrong. And uh, I thought Notre Dame played good as well. I think these teams kind of should just stay ranked the way they were because that's what the way the game went. It was 2019 Georgia. Uh, they kicked a field goal late. Um, so I not too much to say about this game other than Georgia is, is a little bit better than I thought because of the quarterback play. It's kind of comparable to what we were just talking about with Ohio State. Um, the quarterback play is not that good, so I don't think they're as good as they, they, we, we perceive them to be. And Georgia is better, but Jake Fromm played pretty well for Georgia and made some big plays. What, were you, what was your thoughts on this game? To me, I think this is more about Notre Dame and the fact that I don't think Coach Kelly has control of this team anymore. Interesting, interesting. I, I think he's had enough time to bring in his own guys, oh, recruiting-wise, yeah. and he hasn't been able to get the job done. Now, I'm not going to sit here and write this team off only in week two, um, but they had to bring in a freshman quarterback at one point, and then Brandon Wimbush, who is their junior starting quarterback, 19 for 39. So when you have 20 incompletions, yeah, exactly. he did throw for 211 yards, didn't have any touchdowns, no interceptions, which is a good thing. Um, but when you have 20 incompletions, that is uh, not a model for success. No. Rushing, your leading rusher rushed for 53 yards. Now, Georgia is a good team. They play in the SEC, uh, the best conference uh, in college football, in my opinion. I think you can agree with that. But to only rush for your leading rusher to have 53 yards, that to me is on the coach. And, and I, I don't think this Notre Dame team, they're, they're in the top 25. To begin the season, they weren't. They are were actually unranked. Had a couple good wins to start the season, so now they're ranked 24th. Um, but I, I just, I don't know, it doesn't feel like the, the same Notre Dame teams of old. I don't feel that they're getting the same recruits that they have in past. I think players, especially back east, are you know going to other schools like Ohio State and Michigan and some of the other top schools. They're, they're kind of skipping over Notre Dame in a sense. Yeah. So I feel that uh, two things, the coach and their recruiting or their non-recruiting in a sense is really hurting this team and I think it's showing on the field and, and to be honest uh, I think this is Coach Kelly's last year with Notre Dame I can see that too yeah uh, in, especially since he's been there for a long time and he was the national championship coach right he was the coach when they went to the national championship yes. against Alabama yes. so he's been there long enough and you're right he's now going down it's not like he's rising up like say a Jim Harbaugh is or a Clay Helton he's going down so, yeah, you're right. He's definitely going to be on the hot seat. He's going to be in that more Kevin Sumlin territory soon. Uh, I just saw some. If you want to move right back up, you have the screen here. Uh, the rush, go to, go to the rushing stats. Brandon Wimbus, 16 carries for one yard? That's got to be a typo, right? I think so. <laughs> that's got to be a typo. That doesn't seem right. It says on ESPN that he had 16 carries in one yard. Hopefully that's not true uh, because that would mean that he really failed in the running game and just another, another um, thing to put on Notre Dame. I do think their defense played still pretty well against Georgia. I just, you're right, the offense just wasn't much. Um, and that, especially that rushing game of uh, Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb, too, that, that's dangerous. That's a lot like the USC running. Uh, For Georgia. Running game. Yeah, Not as good, but still, those are two good running backs. That's hard to stop as well. But um, yeah, I think Notre Dame will be right back in the rankings. They'll still be there. I don't think they'll lose too many games this season, but I think it was more Georgia impressed me in this game. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like I said, for me, this is more about Notre Dame and the fact that they are they're not playing up to their level 
uh, or their potential in a sense. Totally. Uh, so let's move on to another uh, uh, ranked game. Number three, Clemson defeated Auburn 14-6 to in what was a defensive battle. Uh, Jared, your initial thoughts on this game? Uh, for me, th- I think this is more about, about Clemson, really. Um, you know, obviously, when you lose a Deshaun Watson and a Mike Williams and you're coming off a national championship, there's a lot of pressure. And for Dabo Sweeney to have to replace those players, that, you know, it is no small task. Um, but I think this team has the talent to do it, I think they're still very young. I think right now they're playing a lot of freshmen and sophomores, so they have the talent, they just don't have the experience. I think overall, um, throughout the season, that's something that's going to hurt this team in the long run. Um, But hey, they were able to hold Auburn to six points, and Auburn, with Gus Malzahn, and the way that they kind of a air raid attack in a sense, they're pretty much exclusively in the shotgun. They do like to run the ball, um, but I was watching a little bit of this game. They were... Uh, inside the red zone, like at the two yard line, and they got stuffed three straight times. They literally ran the ball up the middle three straight times. <laughs> like, how bonehead can you be to not at least change it up, run outside, do a play pass, something? You just want to run the ball up the middle three straight plays? You deserve to get stuffed. If I'm Clemson, I'm oh. saying, go ahead, try to run the ball on me because you're not going to do it. So, um, yeah, like I said, even though. Uh, Auburn, I think, is a great team, and they're still going to be in the top 15. I think this is more about Clemson and the fact that they were able to retool with such a young team. Oh, totally. No, and Clemson's defense really showed out in this game. 11 sacks. Wow. 11 sacks. 11? Yeah, 11 sacks. Uh, It's not a typo. Okay. Yeah. But uh, so the defense played well. As long as Clemson's defense is like this, they're going to have a chance. Uh, They have a big game. I believe they play Louisville, right, this week? They do. So that is the marquee th- matchup is, of the week. Yeah. And for both those teams, it's almost, uh, I don't want to say it, but it's almost like a title uh, a title opportunity killer for one of these teams. Well, because they both play in the ACC. Yeah. And, and the ACC is, especially with Florida State losing DeAndre um, Francois, the ACC is not one of the better Power Five conferences. It's I wouldn't say it's the top one, one of the top three. I'd say it's the fourth. So... If you're looking at those divisions to get in, it's going to be hard for an ACC team to get in, especially with one loss. If there's other teams that have one loss that are they're in better divisions or better conferences. So I think it would be difficult. Kelly Bryant, gutsy performance too. I mean, there was tons of times where he would just get battered and beaten down on sacks and stuff like that. So I thought he played well. But both defenses played well. I mean, obviously 14-6 the game. Auburn's defense is no slouch. Uh, but... You're right. The offense for Auburn uh, didn't didn't use their didn't play call well in key moments. I think that was one of the biggest reasons they lost. Yeah, I, I that this game right here did not give me confidence that that Auburn will be able to compete with Alabama at yeah, all no. this year. I think this this is no doubt now Alabama's. Let's say uh, I have one of those hail division. marys or something like that. That would that's what it's going to take for Auburn to come back and win. Exactly. So uh, two other things we want to talk about before we go to break. Uh, Lamar Jackson. Uh, they beat. I believe it was uh, North Carolina, 47-35. Lamar Jackson, 627 yards and six TDs. Just a you know, typical day Should at I the just office. say that? Should we just not say anything else? No, no. Say, you said it's so casual. Yeah. 627 yards and six touchdowns. That's 627 all-purpose Did yards. North Carolina not prepare for him? Do they not, under, do they not understand I he's the yeah, Whoever their defensive coordinator should just be fired. fired Lane right Kiffin style on the plane. Should have been fired yesterday. On the plane. And they were at home. So they should have just <laughs> fired him on the bus back to the facility. Yeah, yeah. While they're walking off the field. For, I'm just kidding. No, that's don't weird. fire that's the guy. a little harsh. It is a little harsh. Man. Well, Lane Kiffin deserved it. But okay. Yeah, yeah I just, sorry. I had to get that out there. It's all right. You, 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 you feel better? Yeah, yeah. 100%. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm now smiling. Uh, Florida Atlantic, by the way, 0-2 this season. <laughs> Lane Kiffin, just, to, just, put, throwing out the just to put that out okay. there. Uh, and another thing we want to talk about, Washington State with a huge comeback. I thought they were getting killed. I think they were down by 20 points. Backup quarterback, Tyler uh, Hilinski. 25 for 33, three touchdowns after coming in for an injured Luke Falk. So great game for him. Does this impress you with Washington State? Does it make them uh, maybe one of the better teams in the Pac-12 North because they can come back? No. <laughs> Who's their head coach? It's, it's Mike Leach. And what do they do? I, I should have known. I forgot Mike Leach was their head coach. My bad. Hello? So Mike Leach is not getting off now like Joey Bosa got off with us. Oh, man. You're throwing some shade today. No, no, no. Because Joey Bosa, I, in my opinion, is, is one of the best defensive linemen in the game. We he can't is. really talk about him too much, he even is. though he held out and played well. We thought he wasn't going to play well. Mike Leach is not off the hook for you, even after this comeback? That's what I'm kind of try, no, trying to get you to do. They were playing an unranked Boise State team at home. 
So the fact that they were down by 20 plus points in the first place yeah. is something to be said for themselves. Now, when you say it like that, that's true. And know. they, Washington State is ranked 20th. Um, I will say this. They also throw the ball 150 until times Mike per game. Leach retires. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel that he will ever win anything oh, man. because of his offense. You have to have some type of running game. You have to have a little bit of balance. I understand you want to throw the ball more than you run. But listen, both of these quarterbacks combined to throw for uh, 67 pass attempts. Now, their quarterback ratings combined were, were good. Um, but listen, if I'm a defensive coordinator, yeah, you're going to get some completions on me. But if I know that you're not going to run the ball, that just that you're, you're helping the other team. Well, obviously they didn't. Again, they didn't game plan because they no. gave up 47 points. And if I'm a running back getting recruited... Fired on the tarmac. Why, right would, I, why would I ever want to go to Washington State? You're, oh, that's, like, that's no. like a, a, a career killer. Yeah, you want, I think he's just going there just to go to Washington State. It must like be, football. Washington yeah. State must be a great campus and it must be a great school because that's the only reason I would ever Pullman. go. And Pullman, Washington. Pullman, Washington. Right near Idaho. Um, so, that's no, right. listen, it, it's a great comeback, obviously, for this team. The fact that they were able to not give up and, and persevere and come back is great. And Mike Leach and this team does deserve credit. I don't want to just completely slam them to the ground. But no, like I said, the fact I think that you they were, did that, but whatever. I did. Okay, is it too late to come back? <laughs> it's too late to okay, come back. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just uh, like my Lane Kiffin barbs, little, I can't come much. back for now. I got I got to talk crap on Lane Kiffin now for the rest of the season. Pretty much. Yeah. But uh, no, they do deserve some credit. The fact that they were able to come back and win. Uh, but listen, when you're when you're playing an unranked team at home, it shouldn't be that hard to beat them. Now, boys, you say is a good team, but. I Washington State in the Pac-12. Come on, they they need to set their 100%. game up. I agree. And if they want to be able to compete with the rest of this Pac-12, that's not how you're going to do it. No, totally. Uh, so that's the end of the college football uh, segment. We're going to go uh, to a segment that we both like to to play, right, Jerry? We What's like to play. Uh, it, it's called Do You Care? Oh, and it's going to be on the other side of this break. This is Cover Two Podcast on OC Rock Radio. We will be right back. And you like Triple G and Canelo? Triple huh? G and Canelo, boy. Ooh, that's the fight. That might that's be the fight the of the fight decade. Right there. That might be the fight of the decade. And I I expect Canelo to destroy, dude. Period. Destroy. Destroy. That's so disrespectful. That's not disrespectful. Yes, it is. No, it's not. A swing and a bouncer to third. Urshela. Clubs. Throws. Ball game. A record tying night in Cleveland. The Indians have matched the American League record. They have won 20 in a row. Lakers fans, we have got a date. You better mark in that calendar. Kobe Bryant's jersey retirement. As first reported by TMZ, the Lakers are planning to retire Kobe's jersey prior to their December 18th game against the Golden State Warriors. And although the Lakers have yet to confirm this, they did send a letter out to their season ticket holders advising them to hold on to their tickets for that day for a special event. OC Rock Radio, you're listening to the Cover 2 Podcast. I'm Nick Nina. I'm Jared Smith. Jared, you know what time it is, right? Oh, yeah. It's time for Do You Care? <laughs> Nick gets really the excited, game, by the way. The game where we, we tell you if we care about the event that we ask each other about, if that was a confu- that was a very confusing uh, a little way bit. I said that. A little it bit. was kind of confusing, yeah. I know you're excited, but... Uh... I'm, I'm way too excited. Okay. I'm right. back take, in the corner. Take uh, <laughs> um, but so, Jerry, I'll ask you first question uh, of do you care? First time. I think it's the first time in a while we've done do you care. It has, because we did not do, we did do a do you care, care segment last week. So we got to do it. Now I'm excited. All right. So here we go. Uh, Jerry, do you care that the Lakers are retiring Kobe's number eight and number 24 jersey at Staples Center next year. Season. Yes, I do care. Uh, multiple reasons. Obviously, growing up a Laker fan, um, you know, Kobe was the Michael Jordan of my generation. And the fact that there has never been an NBA player to have two jersey numbers retired. That's right, Michael Jordan. He we oh, are you throwing shots at MJ? No, I'm just saying. Oh, okay. The tone of voice seems a little different, but... I'll let it go uh, before I was rudely interrupted. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, um, I, I'm very happy for him, and I, and I feel that it's well-deserved. I mean, really, you weren't what? Were you just only going to retire eight and not 24? There was no way. He won three championships wearing the number eight jersey, um, playing alongside Shaquille O'Neal and Derek Fisher, 
uh, mainly when Phil Jackson, that was the first go around with that whole team. And then when he switched to number 24 in 2009 and 2010, won back-to-back championships with Pau Gasol, back still had Derek Fisher, Lamar Odom, and, and that whole new cast. So really, um, I think it was kind of a no-brainer for this team to retire both. And uh, I was actually looking yesterday for tickets for that specific game. Uh, I believe it's going to be December 18th, if I'm not mistaken. The cheapest tickets are $735. Who? That's more than his, uh, his final game. Nick, you want to go? What's up? You want to go? $735? No. No? No. That's not seven hundred three dollars to see a guy get his jersey retired. Okay, I mean if TV. if if we start saving now, uh, I mean possibly. Possibly. Yeah, that's see, this is gonna be this is gonna be funny, but uh, I think that's around the same time Dave Johnson's gonna come back. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's gonna be so I'm gonna con- be more excited about that. Conflicting we'll about that in schedules. Segment, but that's it's gonna be too much. Nick's gonna be a little be busy. Too much. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry I even asked. Uh, <laughs> Nick, do you care that the Dodgers finally ended their eleven game losing streak? Yes, I do care a lot because this was stressing me out the last couple of weeks. The Dodgers couldn't win a damn game. They had lost, I think it was like 16 out of 17 games and had lost 11 straight. They finally won last night. Kenley Jansen almost blew it in the ninth, so we almost lost again. Uh, but this is, oh man, for, I, I, I'm like echoing every single Dodger fan right now. What is going on with this team? Seriously. They were the best team in baseball, and now they're fighting to, for first place in the, in, the, in the record. They're fighting for the, the best record in the MLB now. They're actually in a fight with Washington Nationals. The Nationals are four games back of them of the best record. That's ridiculous. Uh, the pitching staff needs to turn around. Uh, the bridge to Kenley Jansen it hasn't, has still not been figured out for some reason. And, and the hitting, especially the, the better players like Chris Taylor and Justin Turner and, and Cody Ballinger, has gone down a lot. Um, and I personally think it was due to some, uh, some of the acquisitions. I think we, we acquired too many guys that kind of mess with the team flow, specifically Curtis Granderson, who has done essentially nothing for the Dodgers since he got there, and sending Jock Peterson down. Although his stats weren't that good, Peterson was kind of one of the, the team guys. And you could see it when, right when he left, and it had to do also with the Rich Hill failed perfect game as well. Um, that all that stuff kind of compiled and it became uh, where the team was different. The lineup was different every day. And that lineup that was winning all these games wasn't winning. So, uh, yes, I do care because the Dodgers, man, they need to step it up soon or this is going to be a team that, that goes into the playoffs. Then that's not a good thing. Uh, Jared, do you care that the Indians have won 20 consecutive games and are actually currently playing trying to win their 21st right now? I do because it's 20. A lot of teams can win five games in a row, ten, even ten games, you know, get into that double-digit win streak. But uh, for the Indians to get to 20, and they're up right now 4-1, to one, looking like they could go to 21, I think it's pretty remarkable in baseball. Um, you know, with, especially in the second half of the season, with all the injuries that go on, your, your starting pitching rotation, um, I think it's really, really interesting and really cool for me right now, baseball seems a little boring, especially with football coming back. You've got uh, the Triple G and Canelo fight coming Absolutely. up, which we're going to get to in a minute. Um, baseball right now, it's kind of a, in a lull period. It's like, it's like okay, we're, there's so many games into waiting the season, the yeah. and everyone's waiting for the playoffs. So I think this is a really, really cool story um, for the Indians. Obviously, last year having that heartbreak season, getting so close to winning the World Series. Um, and, and I think they you know, easily have a chance to get right back there. So uh, a really cool story for this team. Terry Francona, I mean, what can you say about the guy? He is a mastermind, and um, he has this team rolling, and... Um, you know, he deserves that paycheck, that big paycheck that he received from the Indians a few years ago. So um, good story. Really, really cool to hear. Nick, do you care, uh, speaking of Triple G and Canelo Alvarez, that the fight is this weekend? Are you watching? Uh, yes, I do care. I'm, I'm going to try to watch okay. uh, as best I can. Uh, this, this is an interesting fight because it, it, this, these, in my opinion, are the two best boxers in the world. And they're fighting each other. Uh, Canelo Alvarez... Uh, has really stepped up ever since he lost to Floyd Mayweather um, back a couple years ago when Mayweather was still, uh, I wouldn't say in his prime, but Mayweather was still, you know, doing his thing. And, um, and Triple G, obviously, has been one of the best boxers the last couple years. Both these guys trained in Los Angeles. Um, this is going to be a good fight. This is not going to be Mayweather and McGregor where it's one guy's clearly better than the other. These guys are pretty even. If I had to call it, 
I'm going to say Canelo Alvarez wins the fight. A lot of people are saying Triple G. I think Canelo Alvarez. I'm on Alvarez, that Triple G. You're on the Triple G. Yes, I, I think Canelo Alvarez is going to win the fight. I think he's underrated. I think he's a good fighter. Uh, but it's going to be a good one. If you're if you're a fan and if you liked that Mayweather um, McGregor fight, although there was a lot more entertainment in that one, this is going to be an axing boxing match. When you see these guys really lay in some of those right and left hands to each other, you're going to be like, okay, this is really boxing. Uh, so try to watch it as best you can. But yeah, I do care. This is going to be a good fight, and it's going to be a fun weekend, for sure, with all the football and this fight included. Uh, Jared, do you care that John Jones' B sample failed, which means it's pretty clear he did steroids uh, before his Daniel Cormier fight? No, I don't care. And I'm going to keep this very short and sweet for those who are listening. Here we go. This is the second failed I think drug more, test. I think it's more than that. I okay. It's at I, least three. I believe you're right, yeah. Um, I was just reading on it. He took once. He did... Yeah, uh, steroids twice. What I'm trying to get at is this guy obviously has not learned from his past. He has gotten multiple opportunities to uh, redeem himself and and get second and third chances, and he obviously still doesn't get it. His uh, representatives came out and said that they don't know how those antibiotic steroids got into oh, yeah, his system. Sure he didn't. Yeah. Of course they don't. So um, no, he's an idiot. He's a fool. I'm glad <laughs> that he got stripped of his uh, title belt, and he really should be banned. I don't think he should be able to fight anymore. And I think that's the only way that this guy is going to fully understand what he's doing. Because if they keep giving him chance after chance, yeah, he'll stay clean for six months to a year. And then he's going to go right back to what he's doing. So, no, he's dumb. And he should be banned for life. Interesting. I want to see that steroid fight between John Jones and Brock Lesnar, though. D- Listen, if you want to have a steroid fight... Just have fight, them both do steroids and have them just beat the hell out of each let, other. Let them go at it. But, um, no, you want to cheat and you want to come out and use steroids and then and, you know have an unfair advantage? No, you're, you're a loser. You should be bad. Yeah, I agree. You got one more question to ask me. I do? Yeah. Oh, man. Ace. I was thinking we were done. No. No? Oh, Nick was very excited about this question, we were by done the way. Too. I know. Yeah. All right. I'm Nick... Excited. Here's your last question. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Do you care that the Oakland Athletics, this is actually really, really cool, are offering a uh, free admission game next season? No, I don't care because I'm not going to be able to go because it's in Oakland. But I, this is a very interesting thing. Uh, you obviously never see this in professional sports. I think if there's one stadium and one team to offer it, it is the Oakland A's because they don't have the best facility. But I, that's going to be cool. I mean, you're going to have people clamoring to get in. People are going to be able... I wonder how they're going to do the seats, too. Are they just going to be uh, first come, first serve? So that should be very interesting. I believe it's what April 18th or something like that uh, against the White Sox. It's a 7 yes. o'clock game, too. It's not just one of these day games where you wouldn't have a lot of attendance. They're doing this because it's the 50th anniversary of the Oakland A's playing in the Oakland Coliseum, the stadium they still play in. Uh, so it's a just commemorative thing, and it's a cool thing. I think the Oakland A's know that they're not going to be a you know, a World Series team more than likely next year, and it's less cra- it's a lot of crazy things happen. So they're they're going to offer this game, and they're going to make they're going to make some cool happen. I, I do think it's cool. I don't care just because it's the A's and it's whatever. I mean, I'm not going to be able to go to the game. I don't care about the A's, but uh, but this is a cool this is a cool move by an MLB team to do something like this for sure. So I'll definitely be watching that game on TV, but not there to watch it in person. All right, that's the end of the Do You Care segment. We'll be back. Uh, after this with some more NFL talk. A lot more games to talk about, and we'll do a a little bit of a prediction for next week as well on the segments. We'll be right back on the Cover 2 podcast. They dominate the Colts 46-9. Win number one for Sean McVay. And more questions for Indianapolis. These guys are going to be factors come the end of the year, and in all likelihood we'll meet once again in the postseason. But I'm not discouraged by anything I saw from Seattle, and this was a big home win to open up the season for the Green Bay Packers against one of their rivals. DJ Johnson has a wrist. We'll find out the severity of that. It happened on the fumble. And then uh, Jermaine Gresham got ribs, and we'll see how the x-rays turn out. But uh, other than that, it was it was a, a very disappointing second half to the ball game. We're back here on the Cover 2 podcast, OC Rock Radio, final segment of the day. And we're going to be talking about NFL again. Uh, once again, I'm Nick Nenad. I'm Jared Smith. And so let's move to uh, my team, my favorite team, <laughs> my uh, team. in the NFL, <laughs> uh, the Arizona Cardinals, who decided to lose this week, um, unlike Jared's Cowboys. So he has one up on me this week. I do. Uh, but the, uh, the bigger story, the game was whatever. It did, Matthew Stafford played well. 
and the Cardinals didn't play that well on offense. Uh, but the biggest story coming out of this is uh, the Cardinals losing David Johnson uh, to a broken wrist out two to three months. So, like I said, he's going to come back around Christmas. It's going to be a Christmas present for us Cardinals fans as long as we're still in the race. But uh, I'll let you say uh, something about it because you got to have an unbiased opinion about the injury. Uh, what's your first take on let's, the game first and then uh, David Johnson's injury? So the game, obviously, David Johnson, one of the best running backs in the NFL. So this is going to be a huge blow. He's an every down back. I remember him speaking earlier in the offseason season. And he said he wanted to have 1,000 yards receiving and 1,000 yards rushing. Yeah. He wanted to be the, the bell cow, the workhorse, pretty much the guy um, that this Arizona Cardinals team on offense is getting a little long in the tooth. And I think we've talked about this before with Carson Palmer and Larry Fitzgerald, more than likely this being their, their last final seasons. Um, so really, it was they were going to lean heavily on David Johnson. And now that you don't have him, you're going to have to lean on Kerwin Williams. And uh, they did just resign Chris Johnson. So... Um, it's not that they can't do it. I think it's just the fact that David Johnson does so much for you in, in the running game, the passing game, and the blocking that it's it's going to be tough to replace. And it's going to take multiple guys to do it, which you know can, can hurt you in certain situations. So this team is definitely talented, and they can do it. And because of the division that they're in, realistically, with, with only Seattle um, being the only other legit contender, I think they can still, you know, squeak out a wild card. Um, I, I believe I did pick Seattle to win the division and Arizona, you know, potentially having that wild card spot. But uh, no, it, it's obviously a big loss. And um, Bruce Arians is going to have to get more creative in how this team runs their offense. Yeah. Carson Palmer throwing three interceptions in this game against the Detroit Lions is not what you're looking for, um, especially in week one. I actually picked Arizona to win this game. I did not think that Matthew Stafford would come out and light it up and have... Now, by the way, um, he did earn his contract on Sunday. Oh, totally, 100%. He, he, he had his 27th comeback win in the NFL. So even though all the all the slack and... and it was at know, home, though. It was at just, home. Just get him a road game. Oh, okay. One okay. That's, right. That's right. Very true. Yeah, I, so I was trying just, to give the guy a little credit, I, I, actually. I know. I and did, you kind of just, just pissed because he beat the Cardinals, so I, I have to... I know. I, I'll I'm let sure you'd be saying over. the same stuff about the Giants if we... <laughs> the Giants a little bit. Won. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But guess what? My Cowboys won, so I don't need to. Uh, I don't need to be reminded of that, Jerry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'll let so you take week, over. Week three. Week three. Week three. Okay, so my impression on the game, the Cardinals were winning most of the game uh, just via their defense, it played really well. Um, I thought the defense played great until the fourth quarter. I think they got tired. I- I'm not going to put too much blame on this defense. The offense uh, could not stay on the field, and the defense, uh, I- I'll give them the- a slack on this. Is they- a lot of the third downs uh, that they- they were easy third downs to stop, they didn't stop. And so they kept themselves in the field a long time. But I think specifically, Justin Bethel played really well. In the first half, he's the second corner, the guy that gets all the passes thrown to him since Patrick Peterson's the other corner. He played very, very well just until late, and it's hard when you're the guy getting thrown out every single time and they're throwing long passes and you're on the field too much. I think it got tough for them. Try not to make, I'm not making excuses. I'm just trying to figure out exactly why the defense kind of flubbered in the fourth quarter. I think that's why. Yeah, I also think it's because it is week one, and you have to remember that in the preseason, they don't the, play in the, the full starters game. Yeah. get at best, uh, a half of a game to play. Yeah. So typically the first game, you're playing one series. The second game, you might get a quarter if you're lucky. The third game is kind of the tune-up game, uh, really the preparation game. So you're, you're more than likely starters are going to play a full half. And then the fourth preseason game, the starters really don't play at all unless it's, it's a, a roster battle or, or a position battle. So you have to remember week one, these players, not to say that they're not conditioned, but I think in the fourth quarter, especially with uh, you watch the game with, with how much Arizona's defense was on the field. Yeah. I think the, the conditioning factor and just, you know, not being used to playing a full four quarters really came into play. So I think as the season goes on, week three, week four, these players are going to get a little better conditioned because really you can't duplicate um, the the NFL speed or an NFL game. I don't care, care how hard you practice or you know what you do. Um, relating game speed and game football just it is very tough to do. So I have to you know say that's a little bit why I think this Cardinals team kind of fell off towards the end. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I also think 
they're missing that Michael Floyd type receiver also uh, for Carson Palmer to hit. They got a lot of short guys, and Fitzgerald's not really in that position anymore. So I do think, although you don't want necessarily Michael Floyd on the team, you are missing that big threat, and I don't think anybody's been able to take that position back for the Cardinals. So uh, Palmer has to do a little bit more, uh, which stress, it seems to stress him out, but some of those interceptions were terrible on Sunday. Uh, moving on to another team you just said uh, that you, you thought would be first place in the NFC West, the Seattle Seahawks. They had a game against the Green Bay Packers. This is one of the better games, uh, or at least to be projected, one of the better games of the weekend. Packers won 17-9. Some controversy in this game, but nonetheless, Packers won it. Seahawks didn't score a touchdown. And in my opinion, that offensive line is, is still as bad as it was last year. And it's just it hasn't been fixed. And I'm going to keep saying this. Until they figure out that those guys step up, the Seahawks, are they're not going to run away with the NFC West. And that's why for some, uh, somehow the Cardinals will still have a chance in, in, in the end, more than likely, because even with the, the injury of Dave Johnson, because the Seahawks aren't going to be able to take over this, the division. The defense is still amazing. You have the stars. But as long as this offensive line is not good, they're going to have games like this against good teams when they lose 17-9. to Yeah, uh, unless Seattle drafts, uh, in the early rounds, drafts you know high, they high have talent to start doing with now. the offensive line. They're not going to get any better. They have no money to allocate towards that offensive line as far as free agency goes because of all the money that they've had to put into this defense. And I think that's the the issue that they're in right now. No, that's totally true. A few years ago, when this team was first coming up, when Russell Wilson was a rookie, before they paid Richard Sherman and Cam Chancellor and Earl Thomas and all these. Uh, these superstar defensive players before they gave them big contracts, yeah, it was great. They could go out and, and spend money in other areas, mostly on the offensive side of the ball. But after, you know, the, remember, there's a salary cap, and you can't, that's a hard cap. You cannot go over that at all. So the fact that this team does not have a lot of money, extra money to spend, the only way they're going to get better on the offensive line is by drafting well. And I think they've tried, attempted to do that. I just don't think it has su- succeeded yet. Um, but still, I think this game came down to Russell Wilson and really just not executing. I understand that you know you need protection and you need your offensive line to play well, but he also can run. And I think, listen, he only attempted 27 passes, only completed 14 of those 27, and he threw for 158 yards. Yeah, That sounds like a high school quarterback right now. Now, listen, <laughs> he was going up against Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers, and it was week one. So I'm not going to sit here and completely kill the guy. But when you're a $100 million quarterback and you're the face of the franchise, your numbers need to be way better than that. Oh, and I don't totally think he agree. played well at all, regardless of what the Packers tried to do. So, no, like you mentioned, they, I was really hyped for this game. This was one of the, uh, you know, kind of better games that we thought was going to be played. And it turns out it was somewhat of a dud. It was, yeah. Uh, really until the third quarter when uh, Aaron Rodgers hit Jordy Nelson over the middle for like a 35-yard touchdown. That was really one of the most exciting, you know, plays of the day. Absolutely. It was also pretty cool. The Bennett b- brothers got to play against each other. Absolutely. Martellus. Um, and uh, why am I blanking on the other brother's name? Michael Bennett. Michael, thank yeah. you. Uh, they got to play against each other. That was really cool. Obviously, Martellus is the tight end, and Michael's a defensive end, so they're on the field at the same time. But, uh, no, other than that, uh, Russell Wilson needs to step his game up and, and get it in gear. Um, Eddie Lacy also returning to Green Bay didn't. What really a game need. for Eddie Lacy! Five carries for three <laughs> yards. Yep. Not the greatest nope. average. Nope. No. But the key question is: Did he make his weight and get all those uh, big contracts? He in the did. Offseason? He, he made did. some extra money this offseason because he just was by not able being fat. Weight. That's it. Like I would literally love to do that. Uh, same with me. Yeah. yeah. Pay me all day. I'm not fat. I will always I get, make weight. Uh, pff, same with me. Make $100,000. Yeah, weight. we need to somehow finagle that. In, <laughs> into yeah, our contracts? Into our contracts. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go talk to the producers. So uh, oh, so it. you mentioned Eddie Lacy. I did want to mention this. Uh, no running game for the Seahawks. No. Uh, the, the, the largest rusher was Russell Wilson. That was just two plays where he just found holes. And when he was able to run, run the defense uh, or run away from the defense, uh, their leading rusher was uh, Carson. I don't even know the guy's first name. Six carries, 39 yards. C.J. Prosize, four carries, 11 yards. And like you mentioned, Lacey, five carries, three yards. That's horrendous. Yeah. That's terrible. I, in the Russell Wilson ones, those were passes that turned into runs. Those weren't runs. So they're running the ball, what, like 13 times the entire game? That's not going to work. They, they, need to, they need to help the running game so that the offensive line can – it's just – 
They just need to fix a lot on offense yeah. because defense obviously is fine. Defense don't need to fix anything on. The offense really needs to figure it out or they're going to be, like I said, they're going to be risking not even making the playoffs. Head coach uh, Pete Carroll did say that he believes Thomas Rawls is going to come back for week two. That's, so I, knew this, I knew this one more That's definitely going to be a boost. I think the issue with this team is I don't think they have a clear number one back. Now, there's nothing wrong with having a, a you know running back committee, but I do think you need to find – um, somewhat of a, a bell cow or a yeah. guy that can handle the ball 15 Well, a good example times. is uh, when LeGarrette Blunt was on the New England Patriots, they had a Perfect. lot of running backs, exactly. and, but he was their guy. You know, when they really needed to play, he was the guy to come in. Yeah, so very much so. So I think if you can have Rawls be that lead back, give him 15 to 18 carries a game and be the majority leader, and then have C.J. Procise and Eddie Lacy kind of, uh, you know, just, just uh, come in and, and spell him when needed, I think that's the way this team needs to go because right now, when you have Russell Wilson as your leading rusher, that is not a recipe for success. No. So they're going to – but I, I'm still not writing them off. I still think – I'm not either. I'm just saying that it, it, this is going to be one of those divisions in the NFC West where the team that gets second is not making the playoffs, no. more than likely. So a lot like last year, I guess, if you think about it that way. But so uh, it's going to be interesting. Now moving on, uh, this is the only team in the NFC West that won a game. The Los Angeles Rams, and we had fun, so much fun last year, talking crap about the Los Angeles Rams. And Jared, what did they do Sunday to the Indianapolis Colts? Uh, I don't think the Colts knew they were playing a football game. Jared I, think, Goff. I think the Colts thought they were going to be playing like Modern Day or something, like oh, a high school. Uh, is team. that what it was? Yeah, yeah, the Colts were like, oh, hey, we're coming out to LA. Yeah. Modern Day is, you know, top five yeah. ranked high school. Maybe they team thought the they country. were going to play UCLA or something. UCLA still would whoop their Potentially, ass. Potentially, because they made Jared Goff look like the number one overall draft pick. Jared, that he Jared was. Goff skating. He's got, he got lucky this week. I'm telling you, he's still not the guy. But. Uh, rookie head coach, McVay. Good for Sean McVay. Yeah, really coming out and impressing. Um, Todd Gurley still didn't do much. He did have a touchdown, but 40 yards on 19 carries. Todd what, what's going is on with Todd, is it, is Todd it, Gurley's hype? Is That's, it the offensive line, or is it Todd Gurley? No, the offensive line's better than it was last year. The team is better than it was. Like, by, the way, by the way, the score was 46-9. I don't think we mentioned that. 46-9, they slaughtered the Colts. The only touchdown the Colts got, I think, was, what, fourth quarter late in the game? Sounds like it was, a college uh, football score. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, the, the the Rams look better, but you're right. There still are problems. The Colts, without Andrew Luck, like we said, they're, they're screwed. They're not going to even win. I, I wrote this down. Uh, Colts will have trouble winning any games without Andrew Luck. Seriously. Very true. And so they're not a good team. So the Rams, they win the game. The fans are going to think they're good, and, and they're, they're still average. Uh, the problem is you have Goff, who played a solid game but didn't make too many great, great throws. Todd Gurley, 40 yards, like you mentioned. This team, uh, still, it's better on offense, but it's still not what it should be. And with that, D, there's the defense legit. And Aaron Donald's coming back. I think they said he was going to be the highest paid non-quarterback uh, today. Oh, so he's going to get paid, Shut and he deserves it because he's, in my opinion, the best defensive tackle in the league. The best. So the defense is there. It's a lot like the Seahawks, but a little bit better. They have a, a way more... Uh, talent, especially receiver, Sammy Watkins, Robert Woods. Uh, there's a couple tight ends there, pretty good. And uh, Cooper Cup, a, a rookie that Shout was out drafted. To Cooper Cup. Good game for him. Is the one guy that made Jared Goff look especially good this yes. weekend was Cooper Cup, leading the team in receiving. Oh, yeah, yeah even over Sammy Watkins. And obviously, Sammy Watkins is still new to the offense. And yeah, it didn't things. seem like he he did that. Was at five catches for 58 yards. That, that's so a solid game for a guy that literally came on the team two but weeks ago. But the fact that Cooper Cup as a rookie is is coming on, and right now he looks like the number one receiver for this team. Tavon Austin, who last offseason the, the, the Rams signed to a four-year, $40 million contract extension. The worst contract in the um, Tavon Austin is now looking like he's like the fourth receiver on this team because you have Cooper Cup, Sammy Watkins, Robert Woods, and then I would put Tavon Austin, Tavon Austin yeah. fourth. So they're paying and the him tight a, ends are going to get more action than him yeah, too. They're paying him a lot of money to really be a non-factor on this team. So you, I think they're going to have to find... Uh, gadget plays and, and, and trick plays and other ways to get him involved because yeah. you can't be playing paying a guy that much money for him to <laughs> yeah, really be exactly. on the sideline. Just, just, one of the, just one of the bad things they did last season yes. that, that is going to carry over this season and make them more than likely an 8-8 eight eight team. I don't, th- I don't personally think this team will be there when it comes to playoff time. 
Uh, do you think maybe because the Cardinals and Seahawks look like they're not as good that the Rams somehow have a chance? Pump the brakes. Pump oh, the oh brakes. I know. That's what I'm saying. I'm just asking. Oh, okay. No, yeah. I, do you I, think they don't? So you don't think they have a chance? That's a big no. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. That's okay. why I said pump the brakes. We're on the same thing. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. No, okay, no, no, yeah, no. gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, I think we both believe the Cardinals and Seahawks. This is, the, the, with the Rams, this is definitely one of those things where over you don't want to overreact no but it's listen one game. The, the way that they ended the year last year just completely falling off the rails and getting cardinal shut out slaughtering him home, last game yeah this was really really cool to see the rams come out and kick some butt yeah right now obviously it was the in front Colts, of like 30,000 fans that. Too. if they can be competitive in games not to say that they're going to continue to win but if they can just be competitive and at least give some type of hope that their offense can be better than it was last year because like you mentioned the defense is legit and they're going to, with Wade Phillips coming in from Denver with uh, he's won multiple Super Bowls he knows what he's doing if the offense can just keep up and keep this this team in games and maybe they can get i don't know 6 7 wins something like that i think that's a real success for this team this year oh 100% uh so let's uh, we almost we almost forgot to do this let's talk about the the other team in LA but- the Los Angeles Chargers played their first game as the Los Angeles Chargers. And they did the same thing they always did in San Diego. <laughs> they got close and lost. Pretty much. Uh, the, the, the Chargers made a really good comeback late in this game on Monday night. Um, really made it entertaining to watch, at least in the end, because it kind of was a boring game most of the time. Denver, they're, they're a boring team to watch on offense. The defense is fun to watch. And Los Angeles couldn't figure out anything on offense. And uh, they got a couple turnovers, made some big plays, long pass to Travis Benjamin in the, in, the, um, in the corner of the end zone. But, oh, my gosh, the clock management in, in the last minute was one of the worst I've ever seen. I mean, I think they ran three plays. And somehow got, they got a penalty, a lucky pass interference penalty that, was the, that made it so they could potentially have a field goal attempt. Um, their their field goal kicker, you guys, you got this picture up here, uh, Young Way Koo. Is it uh, Young Way Koo? I was going to let you Wei pronounce Koo. that yeah, first because I, I didn't want to sound like I an idiot. I know. I, I made sure I'd know it because uh, I, I wanted to say it right. I didn't want to say Young Ho Koo or anything like that. Young Way Koo, the kicker, drilled the first one, which would have tied the game late in the game. Um, but they, uh, the Denver Broncos, they called timeout right before, and he, sh- he shanked the, the next one. It was a sputtering. It got blocked. Oh, it did get blocked. Yes, right, yeah, blocked. my bad. Um, so the um, the Chargers, like like we said, they're always in close games, and it's just a matter of if they if they win them, and a lot of times they don't. And this is just the same team, and I think this is why they're not as popular as the Rams in L.A. No, they're not. And, and really, I think this came down, like you said, the clock management. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Lynn, another first year head coach, well deserved, by the way. But I think, you know, in those last two minutes, minute and a half, they weren't necessarily prepared. They weren't sure what they were going to do. Were they going to come down and run clock? Or were they just going to come out and fire and try to score whenever and then potentially have to give the ball back to Denver? So I think they were teetering on the fence. And in doing that, you could tell uh, even the announcers, they, you know, they have a camera right on Phillip Rivers. And he's looking over to the sideline like, hey, guys, what are we doing? Yeah. Let's, let's go. Like, let's either speed up. Or, you know, huddle and figure it out. And it was just, a, I think it was just a miscommunication. But the fact that they were able to come back in the first place, I think that shows a lot more about this offense. Um, Denver's defense is obviously very talented. But uh, the fact that they let the Chargers come back, that's a, that's a little concerning to me. Yeah. Well, With- I do think it was, it was mainly turnovers from the Chargers. Chargers defense isn't slouch either. It's it's pretty good defense, especially Bosa and Melvin Ingram. They're the legit guys coming in. So I, I, I don't want to put too much blame on Denver because I think it was more that they were shocked that they had to keep coming on the field at random times when essentially they were just trying to run out the clock. But um, so, yeah, no, L.A. comes in and they um, they they lose their first game. The L.A. Rams win their first game. Uh, Jared, can you pull up the schedule for the NFL uh, this week. Let's do a little pick oh, okay. for next week before we end the podcast. So we can actually, you know, kind of say, oh, well, you know, I wanted to be, we picked them to win and stuff like that. So let's see. So we got Texans and Bengals. I'm That's gonna, a I'm, of a game. I'm going to go Texans. I think they, with Deshaun Watson, they have to win that one. Yes. Uh, congrats to Deshaun Watson for getting that Absolutely. starting job. Absolutely. Yeah, by the Tom way. Savage lasted a half. After watching Andy Dalton completely. Crap the bed. Oh my gosh. They have 20 zero, nothing Ravens. Zero confidence in the Bengals. So, yes, I will be going with the rookie quarterback and the Texans as well uh, on a short week. It's Thursday night Thursday game. Thursday night game. Yeah, absolutely. Well, real quick, uh, how about that ESPN announcing crew? 
this uh, this Monday oh. on the second game. Oh boy! You know what I you know what I actually did? I got so annoyed by the announce crew that I actually started playing the radio. I put the TV on, turned the volume down, and put the radio announcer. I like the radio announcers, Matt Money Smith, and I think it's Nick Hardwick, uh, were on the call. I couldn't stand. You didn't want to listen to Rex Ryan, sexy Rexy. No, what? I didn't. And I don't want to listen to Sergey Dip screw up his his. Uh, his hey, sideline report I, I, either. I feel he got I felt, roasted. I, oh my god! Absolutely roosted on social media. Yeah. I felt a little bad for the guy. I mean, listen, I, I you need to. But be ESPN, more prepared. there's no way you haven't done that before. Of course. And ESPN should put out a guy that actually knows how to do it. Yes. It, it's it's embarrassing on Monday Night Football when you know people are watching. It's it's the LA Chargers first game in LA. I mean, not in LA, but as the LA Chargers. And you got Rex Ryan, who has a monotone voice. Beth, uh, the Beth Bowens, I actually, I, I was, I was fine with her. Oh, she was the first, great. first female announcer ever, yes. or since 1987, to announce a football game too. So good for her. But Rex Ryan, monotone voice. Obviously, there was like no sideline report, but Sergey Dip screwed up the first one so bad. So I actually started listening to the radio. Just wanted to bring that up before we. Well, I wanted to definitely mention that that uh, at least you you saw it too. Just how oh. bad. I think that what we're trying to say is ESPN, step your game up. Step your game up. <laughs> Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, Cowboys Broncos. That's a bit, that's, uh, who you got, Jared? You know where I'm going with this yeah. one. Who you got? Uh, Zico Ella is playing, so I'm going with the Cowboys. So am I. I'm going Cowboys too. Uh, Browns Ravens. Ravens. Listen, the oh, Browns. Oh, yeah, no, Ravens. Huh? The, yeah, the, yeah. the Browns, by the way, only lost by three points to the Steelers. I think we said this in our NFL preview show last week. The Browns are no slouch. No. Now, they're not. We still Steelers think didn't they're play that be good. a bad team. Yeah. But the Browns are they're, they're coming along. They're going to win four games. The, uh, you know, obviously, um, Garrett, the number one overall draft pick, is going to be out with a high ankle sprain, so yeah, that tough. sucks for them. But uh, to have Jabril Peppers and Deshaun Kaiser, I-, I think it was a smart move by Hugh Jackson to kind of throw the kid into the fire and see what he can do. Because knowing that he doesn't have the greatest team and they're more than likely not going to make the playoffs, what are you going to do, sit there and start Cody Kessler or you know one of your, your other quarterbacks? Put the kid in, let him see what he can do. Mm-hmm. And I think for the most part, he handled himself really well. So... Um, I think the Browns will make this game competitive, but in the end, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to the Ravens. Absolutely, yeah, I, I agree, Ravens. Uh, so Panthers, Bills. I'm gonna go Panthers. Panthers as well. Panthers. I think Cam Newton, even though he did throw an interception in Week One uh, last week, I think he's he's gonna come back to the old Cam, and then having this new weapons Home debut, of Christian too. McCaffrey and Curtis Samuel, the two kind of lightning and lightning running back and receivers. I think that's really gonna help him out. So and, and you're not gonna lose the Bills at home either. No, no, no you won't. Cardinals Colts. I think we both can agree. The Cardinals more than likely after win this game. watching that Colts game, we'll see if they even show up to the game. Yeah, will they show up to their home field to win? Not sure. They should just play in Arizona. Just not. Let's not even make us go travel to Lucas Oil Stadium <laughs> to go play. Uh, so hard. Cardinals. Uh, this is a good game. Titans and Jaguars. This a, a, a better game than probably most people yeah. expected, especially if you look at it like five years ago. Yes, I'm gonna go Jaguars. I'll go Titans. I think Titans lost last week. I think they, they, they rebound. Although the Jaguars look good. That Jaguars defense, nine sacks oh against gosh. the Houston Texans. Dante nine. Fowler Jr. with a fumble return touchdown. Good for him but after that big injury he had. Wow. Uh, but, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll switch on this one. So uh, I got Titans. You got Jaguars. Eagles-Chiefs is another good game. Yeah, another good game. I'm going Andy to Reed the Chiefs just because I want the Eagles to lose. 100%. And I'm going to pick the Chiefs because I think the Chiefs are a better team. Uh, Patriots and Saints. Woo! I think we already talked about this one. The Saints better be ready because the Patriots are going to come they're in. They're going to put up pissed 50 off. on them. They might put they're, up not, they're not going to put 50 uh, on They might. So, you, so if it's based on Vegas, you think it's going to be uh, like, what, 50 to 6 or something like that? Listen, the Saints can <laughs> score when their offense is going. They just can't stop anyone. So if they want to turn this into a shootout, the Patriots are all in. Uh, I, I agree. So we got Patriots winning that yes, game. Right? Yes, we do. Uh, Steelers-Vikings. Uh, Steelers at home. J- T.J. Watt, brother of J.J. Watt, had a game. Two sacks in his first career NFL Good game. Good for him, I know. Uh, starting over. An interception, at, too? Uh, he had a fumble recovery. But that's, okay, that's what it was. And yeah. he also uh, is starting over James Harrison. Mm. So I think that that's a really uh, you know big news for this team, the fact that a rookie can come in and take over for the, the beast that James Harrison is. Um, I think that yeah. was pretty impressive to see. No, that's impressive. I'm going to go Vikings, though. Okay. So just kind of, I think the Vikings had a really good showing on Monday Night Football. Sam Bradford looked better than I thought, so I'm going to go Vikings. Uh, Bears and Buccaneers. Buccaneers' first game of the season. First game of the year. Obviously missed last week uh-huh. because of Hurricane Irma, so glad that they will be able to play uh, at home this week. Um, I'm going to go Buccaneers. I'm going to go Buccaneers, too. I think they'll... Uh, They've had, to- they've had a lot more time than other teams to practice. I just don't think Bears are that good. 
Um, Dolphins Chargers, uh, Chargers home debuted at StubHub Center. Uh, you know, I'm going to go with the Chargers for one reason, because the Dolphins are actually, and I believe they're already here. They are They've been here last week in yeah. L.A. this entire week, obviously, because of uh, the hurricanes going on in Florida. So I think the fact that they aren't able to be at home, they're having to be on the road all week, stay in a hotel, uh, that, that whole combination, plus it's their first game. Absolutely. And Jay Cutler. Don't think we need to say much more than Jay Cutler is the starting quarterback, so therefore I'm picking the Chargers. I am going to pick the Dolphins because I don't what? think Jay Cutler is that bad. What? It's going to be that bad in the system. What are you smoking? Uh, I, I think the Chargers are going to do the same thing they do every week. They're going to get close and they're going to lose because the StubHub Center is not going to provide any home field advantage for them. I think mean, Dolphins have had too much preparation. Uh, I, don't even, I don't know where Tampa Bay practiced last week, but the Dolphins practicing in L.A., that's a pretty good place to practice. I mean, you got great weather, uh, except for today. Today it was cloudy here in Southern California. But I'm going to go Dolphins. Uh, I have nothing against the Chargers. I just think the Dolphins um, are a better team. I just think, I, I think they win the game. Uh, Jets and Raiders. Wow, I think this is Raiders. a no-brainer. Raiders. The- is, there, is there a Ram game, Rams game on there? Oh, there you go. Okay, you, okay there you go. So, um, yeah, just, I think we both Raiders, right? Yes, yeah, yes. Jets, Jets suck. Um, <laughs> Redskins and Rams. This is an interesting game. It is very interesting. Because at, at L.A. In L.A.? Yeah. Let's go Rams. Let, let's go 2-0 oh Rams. Jared Goff, 2-0. Oh. I'm going to go Redskins. Man. I, I, I'm going to go Redskins what only. What you and these quarterbacks, o- man? Only because Kirk Cousins, I just think he, he, can't go to the le- he can't go below Jared Goff. Right? There's no way. I don't know. I did, the Rams are a fake team. Fake news Rams. Fake news Rams. Fake news Rams being I want a being lot good. Of shade over here. Nick. Yeah, I know, hundred percent. I mean, okay. we both agreed they wouldn't make the playoffs. So no, that doesn't mean they're they, going to they're, they're going to go two and zero. That doesn't mean they can't start off two and zero. Hello, anything. They'd can still happen. be in first place if okay. they did that. Right. Right. Uh Forty ers and Seahawks. Let's go Seahawks. I'm going to go Seahawks, but I think it's going to be closer than people think. Really? Yeah. Because the Forty ers look. Like I just don't think that. O- one. I know. I just don't think the Seahawks offense is that good. Okay. Um, and uh, Monday Night Football. Or is that Sunday night or Sunday Monday? Night. Sunday night football. Falcons and Packers. Ah, this is That's a good game. game. Uh, I'm going to go Falcons because they're at home. I'm going to go Falcons too. It's a brand new, first, their first uh, real game in that brand, brand new, new stadium. stadium which is uh, also, the Packers didn't put that good of a showing against the Seahawks, and the Falcons have good defense too. So that will be a shootout. I think it'll be. I think both teams will score 30 points in that game. All right, Monday night football, last game of the week, Lions versus Giants. Hopefully Odell's back. If Odell, if Odell Beckham plays, I'm going to pick the Giants. If he does not play, then I feel that that offense uh, is going to continue to struggle. And the way that the Lions looked last week, if Matthew Stafford can continue to spread the ball around to his receivers, not saying he has to throw four touchdowns, but if he can throw two or three again uh, and Odell Beckham does not play, then I'm going to pick the Lions. I'm gonna, so it's kind of an up-in-the-air pick. Okay, I'm going to go Giants because I do think Odell is going to be back, and I don't think they can put on two consecutive bad performances with that team. I think that defense will be able to stop Matthew Stafford. That defense is legit. Landon Collins, I mean, that defensive line, it's ridiculous. So I, I think the, the Giants will win that game. Um, unless Odell's not there. I want to just preface that. If Odell doesn't play again, That's what I'm saying. I'm, the, Lions, the Lions, I think, have a better chance to win for sure. Yeah. So, that's, that's, that's a that's weird a, pick. I should have just said that bit. in the first place. I don't know why I said that at the end. You wanted to elaborate. Uh, it's fine. Exactly. Uh, so, any last thoughts? I know you want to say one thing. It has nothing to do with sports either. This has absolutely yeah. nothing to do with sports. <laughs> uh, for those of you who do not know... Okay, now I know what you're talking about, too. Apple you... just came out with their new uh, iPhone line, the iPhone X. And uh, it looks really cool. Um, it was all over social media yesterday. Um, I, I don't think it's actually coming out until November, but uh, for those of you who are interested in purchasing an iPhone X, it starts at $999 nice. and goes all the way up to almost uh, $1,100. So with two, pay- so with one paycheck, you could spend it on an iPhone X and Kobe's jersey game. For a uh, cell phone? For Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I no, just, I'm just I, I wanted to make. I, I'm pulling this up right now because I wanted to make sure to let all of you listeners. Apparently, know. it didn't change that much either. No, it didn't, and I, I just that just kind of baffles me. A thousand dollars. Yeah, it's, for a that's phone. that's stupid. I'm just gonna the come out and say it. Just flat. Out, no, you're stupid. not gonna you're not gonna run to the Apple Store and, and no, buy that right now. No, I got my. Even though my phone's cracked, I'm not even gonna go get no that phone. Okay. No, I, I just I, I I heard about that yesterday. 
I just wanted to vent for a minute and say, Apple, you guys are ridiculous. I have all your Screw Apple products. you. No, no, no. Don't, I, I do like Apple. What I'm saying is, does it have to be $1,000? They, they got dual Apple. It, it can't dual be Apple like going on with Google four or 500. <laughs> you can't like help some people out. I know, really. You know? Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just saying. So, help those kids out in China. Yeah, that is my final thought. <laughs> iPhone X, $1,000. Go out and get yours. Absolutely. I just, I, Did I just like help Apple right now? Did I just like... Plug them? No, I think you talked enough crap to where oh, okay. you didn't plug okay. it. Did you have a final thought? Or? I do have a final thought. I want to play the music because we're already in a 30 minute segment. Uh, but so, uh, my final thought is uh, Dodgers, go out and get your second win. Don't let the losing streak continue in a way. Uh, for the Dodgers, go out and uh, I, do, do we know if the Cleveland Indians won their 21st game? Is that game still going on? It's still going on right now. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm pulling for them. They're an AL team, so it doesn't ma- matter too much for either of our teams, Angels or Dodgers, if they break this record. So good for them if they can break the record. Break the record, but Dodgers specifically win tonight. Make it a, make it a winning streak instead of a losing streak. Uh, this has been the Cover Two Podcast. Uh, I'm Nick Nina. and I'm Jared Smith, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>